this is the, well, I don't need this since I'm about 20 feet away from you. <laughs> the second Sunday in Lent, uh, it's about the covenant of life that God gave Abraham and Sarah. We will be reading about that in our Old Testament reading, and therefore the covenant all of us have through Jesus Christ. Uh, for those of you, all of you who are listening, and uh, if, if you have internet and you saw the bulletin, you may uh, print out that bulletin if you want, or if not, just look at it on, the, uh, on your screen. But our, our hymns are all on the back page. So those of you here who have the bulletin, the hymns are, are on the back page, uh, those that are not in the ELW. And the ELW does have a new hymnal, I should say the ELCA. These are from the new hymnal of the ELCA. Uh, we probably, we may not be purchasing that book uh, because many of the hymns are of, of similar to what we have with, uh, with One Voice, the blue book in your hymnal. But we will be using them and we can since we have um, a software called Sundays and Seasons through the ELCA and we will be using the hymns through, through that. So these are out of our new hymnal called All Creation Sings.
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out upon all people, whose goodness cascades over all creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow the outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace. Through the power and promise of Jesus Christ, our sins are washed away. And we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven. In the wake of God's forgiveness, we are called to be the beloved community, living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. The Lord be with you. And also with you. O oh God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. God speaks to us in scripture reading, preaching, and song. Our first reading today is from the book of Genesis, the 17th chapter. As with Noah, God makes an everlasting covenant with Abraham and Sarah. God promises this old couple that they will be the ancestors of nations, though they have no child together. God will miraculously bring forth new life from Sarah's womb. The name changes emphasize the firmness of God's promise. <clears throat> when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, 
and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. We'll read responsibly from Psalm 22. You who fear the Lord, give praise. All of you, you, all you of Jacob's line, give glory. Stand in awe of the Lord, all you offspring of Israel. For the Lord does not despise nor abhor the poor even in their poverty. Neither is the Lord's face hidden from them. But when they cry out, the Lord hears them. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Let those who seek the Lord give praise. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow before the God. For dominion belongs to the Lord, who rules over the nations. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust, though they be dead, shall kneel before the Lord. Their descendants shall serve the Lord, whom they shall proclaim to generations to come. They shall proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying to them, The Lord has acted. Today's second reading is from Romans, the fourth chapter. Paul presents Abraham as the example for how a person comes into a right relationship with God, not through works of the law, but through faith. Though Abraham and Sarah were far too old for bearing children, Abraham trusted that God would accomplish what God had promised to accomplish. <clears throat> the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of, God, of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead, and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations. According to what was said, so numerous shall, be your, shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. Word of God, word of life. Thanks.
the Holy Gospel according to Mark, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. After Peter confesses his belief that Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus tells his disciples for the first time what is to come. Peter's response indicates that he does not yet understand the way of the cross that Jesus will travel. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all of this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in glory of his Father with the holy angels. Believe in the good news. The Gospel of the Lord. In today's Gospel lesson, Jesus speaks quite openly. There is little in this text that requires deep explanation or interpretation. It is a hard truth. When we look back a couple of verses, the context of this narrative is made more apparent. In verse 29, after Jesus asks them, But who do you say I am? Peter answers, You are the Messiah. Whatever glorious ends the twelve disciples associate with that celebrated designation, Jesus shuts them down and sternly orders them not to tell anyone about him. In today's reading, Jesus shifts to what the Son of Man must endure by the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. Rejection, suffering, and death. After this fatal disgrace, he will rise again after three days, None of this is accidental. The Son of Man must undergo this according to God's plan. But Peter is not having it. Taking Jesus aside, Peter rebukes him, admonishes Jesus, and tries to shut him down. Jesus turns to all of his disciples and again speaking openly says, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things but on human things. Jesus' harsh response to Peter is because Peter has assumed an authority that is not his to use. Jesus' focus is on the cross, and he does not tolerate any suggestion that veers from his mission. Peter's suggestion is a diversion similar to Satan's challenge to tempt Jesus in the wilderness to opt for immediate worldly power. Then Jesus opens his teaching beyond the disciples to the overhearing crowd and to us. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who will lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For the sake of the gospel is a crucial condition. To give one's life for the sake of the good news is indeed what Jesus does and who Jesus is. He is the ultimate example of self-sacrifice. To set our minds on the divine, and the only way to be made whole, is to let go of the human things that society counts as most valuable. There is no benefit in gaining the entire world and the values and life goals as people define them if in doing so we forfeit our souls. Ultimately, nothing in this world is worth exchanging for our very being the self that is claimed by the gospel and accountable to God. The only shame that should concern a true disciple is abandonment of the Son of Man. I do feel for Peter, as I know that anxiety. His response to rebuke Jesus is out of fear. Peter is thinking 
what will happen to me right now if what Jesus says is true? It cannot happen. Peter does not imagine Jesus as suffering servant. He knows him as conquering king. How could he die? How can we think divinely instead of humanly? Father Shay Kearns is a writer, speaker, and theologian from Minneapolis and is an ordained priest in the Old Catholic Church. He wrote an article that asks, what happens when a belief we have long held to be true comes under scrutiny? When we find out that there are other people out there, people we love and trust, who believe something completely different than we do, and maybe even contradictory, my Facebook newsfeed comes to mind. How dare you tell me this thing that I believed for so long might not be true? How dare you ca cause me to question my faith? How dare you? The root of these explosions comes from anxiety, from the anxiety of having our beliefs questioned to the anxiety of the unknown. We see this happening not just in faith issues, but also around issues of race, of privilege, of politics, and so much more. What can we do when a belief we have long held to be true gets called into question? Father Shea says we have a few options. We can double down and hold on to our original belief even harder. We can get defensive and shout at the people who dared to call our belief into question. We can shout louder about how we are right and no one can make us stop believing what we believe. Or we can get curious about our own reaction and defensiveness. Curious about why this belief is so important to us in the first place. About the new information we are being presented with and why it is causing us anxiety. Curious about what other people believe and why. At the end of all this curiosity, we might still hold on to our original beliefs. We will also know that we listened to understand and learn something. And that by investigating new information, we also learn something about our original beliefs. We will have earned respect by listening to another person, asking questions, and being curious about why they believe what they believe. We might be able to develop some empathy for other people who believe differently. Belief based on fear, whether it's fear of hell, fear of damnation, fear of alienation from our faith community, our family, or our friends, is toxic and hurtful. It is human thinking. And yes, wading through the anxiety is painful and hard. We might lose connections to people. We might have to relearn how to be in the world. But when we do, we will find our lives filled with people who love us for us, and not because we conform to their way of thinking. We will find that a faith relationship with God is based on love and not fear. Father Shea suggests getting and staying curious, leaning into the anxiety and not away from it, asking questions asking a lot of questions. Christian faith is a call to struggle. It is only by giving ourselves to others as Jesus gave himself for us will we ever find ourselves. Not only must Jesus suffer, but we must as well if we choose to follow him. Taking up the cross means being in the world for the world. This can feel challenging and complicated. Our faith calls us to struggle with real issues of poverty, racism, immigration, hunger, and all that marginalizes God's children. Because that is what happens when we are willing to take on the powers and supremacies of this world. That is what happens when we are determined to show the world that God's love is greater than any human show of might. That is what happens when we say, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news and then live as if we believe it. The cross is Jesus' destination. There, his followers must follow him. Amen.
Let us confess our faith by saying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In our prayers, we want to remember Sarah, Terry's granddaughter, who's having tests. Also, in talking with Kathy Cobal, her mom fell. Thankfully, she's at home, but is recovering with, uh, uh, also with uh, having treatment. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. Your gift of grace is for all people. Give confident faith to all the baptized, that they may follow you wholeheartedly. Give new believers joy in your promises. Give hope and courage to those who suffer for their faith. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. All the ends of the earth worship you, from galaxies to microorganisms. Preserve your creation. Teach humanity to wonder at your works and to join you in tending to creation's well-being. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You rule over the nations. Raise up advocates for peace and justice within and between nations. Give life where hope seems dead. Call into existence new realities we cannot even imagine. We especially ask for you to be with those many nations now where the public is rising up and wanting the government to consider them and their needs. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. In Jesus, you joined humanity in suffering and death. Reveal to all the depth of your love shown on the cross. Accompany all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Restore all who are sick or grieving. Bring vindication for victims of injustice, exploitation, and oppression. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You made Abraham and Sarah the ancestors of a multitude of nations. Bless grandparents and parents and foster parents and the children who look to them for care and guidance. Console those who deal with infertility, parents who have entrusted their children to adoption, and children longing to be adopted. Equip ministers' services to families. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Join me in the next petition. For Griffith Lutheran Church, help us to use our many blessings to grow our church, to make a difference in our lives and in our community. Help us that we may grow Christ-centered relationships in our community through love and service. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We await the day of Christ's coming in glory. Lead us by the example for all the saints whom you have called to take up their cross and follow you, that together we may find our lives in you. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O oh faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Faithful God, you walk beside us in desert places, and you meet us in our hunger with bread from heaven. 
Accompany us in this meal that we may pass over from death to life with Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks, gave it for everyone to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus draws the whole world to himself. Come to this meal and be fed. body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. God of steadfast love, at this table you gather your people into one body for the sake of the world. Send us in the power of your spirit that our lives bear witness to the love that has made us new. In Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. First, thank you, Sherry, for that prelude. That was lovely. Thank you very much. 
And other people here are nodding their heads, so shaking their mask. <laughs> this is uh, next Wednesday again. Uh, for those of you who call to have a meal, you pick them up between 5 and 5.30. Uh, and that usually goes between 5 and 5.30. I was here and, and you're pretty much on time and they have your name on, on the box of, for your food. Also at 7 o'clock on Wednesday, we have a uh, posting on Facebook and YouTube, our services. Uh, I've been faithful, I've been watching it and have, and have been enjoying them. So uh, at seven o'clock on Wednesday evening is our Wednesday evening uh, service. Our March mission, but tomorrow is March one. Uh, hopefully it won't be like February one. <laughs> hopefully March will a little warm up a bit. Um, but our mission is the Hospice of Northwest Indiana VNA, and I know many of you have uh, had hospice in your home and with your loved ones. So uh, our uh, mission committee decided that that was what our mission was going to be uh, for this month of March, the Hospice of Northwest Indiana VNA. Um, once again, to remind you, we were talking, some of us were talking about this morning, the outreach of our church. Many of you don't realize it. We do it through, through our mission, but we also do it through meals. Uh, we provide meals for the homeless, a homeless shelter for men twice a month. And uh, also, so, and that's about, a, we're told about $150 uh, each time we do it for the food that for the food that they prepare and believe me that food is not like something I prepare in my well I don't prepare food so it wouldn't be like that but if I did it would not be like food that I prepare that food uh, is mashed potatoes and those are real potatoes that they boil and peel so, uh, so it is uh, it is very good food uh, given to uh, the homeless shelter and to others, and, and to you when you when you pick them up. Uh, those of you who have a bulletin, or, or maybe it's it's in the north, maybe it's in your uh, um, newsletter. There's uh, an article in there about the prayer chain. It tells who's on the prayer chain. It also offers for you if you would like to be a member of the prayer chain. Uh, once somebody is is told that someone has requested prayers, which we get weekly. Uh, Loretta calls the person on the prayer chain and then they call and it's pretty soon that whole uh, chain of people are praying for, for you and for others. So it is in the March newsletter which did come out so uh, please notice that. And if you are interested in being part of that prayer chain, please let us know. Please stand. You are what God made you to be created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, freed to serve your neighbor. God bless you that you may be a blessing in the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Shaped up flesh. 
I don't know, Sherry. I think this song is worth buying the whole book. It's a lovely song. Did you listen to those wonderful words? The, the first hymn, we become God's living vessels. We, the flutes and pipes and reeds, echoing the Spirit's music through the witness of our deeds. This is lovely. Thank you for choosing that. And thank you, Carrie, for being our preacher today. As you know, as our... Uh, our deaconess intern, she preaches at least once a month, sometimes twice. Go in peace, share the good news. <laughs> 